Excellent. Um, first of all, just welcome. This has been an amazing day. All of the talks have been terrific. And I just want to give a big shout out to the speakers, the organizers, and then especially Hannah and Desmond, who have worked so hard to make this amazing event in this venue. So just please, thank you. Um, I also wanted to give my bachelor rose to Andrew, who gave me the clicker, his clicker when my battery died. So you can get this after. <laughs> Um, my name is Sarah, and I introduce myself as a programmer, comma, person. And sometimes I switch it up and say person, comma, programmer. And for work, right now, I'm in the middle of a sabbatical adventure. And so this talk is going to address the programmer, comma, person aspects of all of us. <laughs> so I was really honored to be asked to speak here. And one of the reasons is because this conference, right on its web page, says it's for curious people. And I love curious people. Um, and because Elixir is a relatively new language, by default, everyone here is an early adopter, is someone who gets excited, is someone who plays with languages in their spare time. And because Elixir is near the beginning of its journey, that means that everybody here, by default, is at the beginning or early middles of our journey with Elixir. So also, we're in LA. <laughs> Which is super exciting, and I, I bought my conference outfit at the airport gift shop. <laughs> I, I have LA fan, I don't even know why, I just have LA fantasies, it's so great. Um, <laughs> people come here, they dig gold, they try to become movie stars, they try to write programming applications with hot swapping capabilities and concurrency. <laughs> um, but in this idea, in this country, the idea of go west is very powerful. Um, whether it's to physical spaces or imaginative spaces, going into the new is something that we put a high premium on here. And so we are all here today, both physically West and New Ideas West, sharing this day together. So just cheers to that. Um, and before I get into the meat of the talk, I want to go over a quick legend. So we're all on the same page. This is a shark. Um, and this is an Erlang shark. And I'll just take a moment to remind us that in our metaphorical understanding of sharks, and also probably in our actual experiences with them, sharks are scary. Um, you could say they represent the deep, the unknown, uh, sudden death while surfing. <laughs> this is a galaxy shark. Um, and there's like three or four documentaries about this recently. Like you're not even safe in space anymore. So. Um, yeah. So this keynote is unequally divided into the following sections. And I want to begin with who we are. And by we, I mean software developers. And as software developers, we are asked to constantly learn new things, languages, frameworks, domains. But at the same time, we come to understand that our role is managing change. We build new applications. We phase out old ones. We change the way business is done effectively. And managing change means talking to people and working with people. And that is often the same again and again. So in short, we're asked to get on the rocket ship and go to new exciting places, but we also need to be able to sit in a living room and have conversations with people. We need rocket ship skills and living room skills, and probably in the proportion that we see in this slide. Um, developer architect and teacher learner, these are two of the roles that we tend to think of ourselves as filling most often. And there's lots of titles surrounding these roles. Like, look at some of these. I'm sure you've had some or all or variations of these or even ones that aren't on the slide. And then take a minute to think about other professions, like lawyers, law or medicine. And they have hierarchies and titles, but you don't really hear lawyers calling themselves like statute hackers <laughs> or law gurus. <laughs> and doctors aren't, you know, body crafts people or lung architects. <laughs> but, I mean, to me, what the plethora of titles really indicates is that software development is truly fluid. What a title means 
and what you do while you have that title is not predetermined, which speaks to the nature of the field. And while we spend a lot of time focused on developing and teaching, one of the things I've learned is that the skills in the bottom two quadrants, which I've bucketed under productivity expert and business partner, are skills that you develop or become aware of, you may already have them, after many years, and are as important, if not more, than the first two. In a given job, these roles all merge and their lines blur. And in fact, in any given product or launch, we flow in and out of these different roles on a frequent basis. We are not individual contributors. We are imperfect circle squarers. <laughs> so as imperfect circle squares, let's go forth and talk about what and why and how we learn. And so since we're at ElixirConf, which is focused on teaching and learning and being productive in a relatively new language, let's start with this balance. Um, individual contributor, individual learner. So as a day-to-day -day dev, you're responsible for many things. So while the sun is up and you're at work, if, if that's how you do it, you're responsible for getting your stories done and being productive. But when the sun is down and you're on your own time, you can choose to learn without worrying about output. And our career cycles between the two. And in fact, we cycle between productivity and learning on many time frames. You can cycle in an hour, a day, or you can take longer dives, spending months or years focused in one area than the other. And I see them like day and night, office time and home time, focused in the world time, and introspective time. And you are the craftsperson, the hacker, guru, make your way along the path. So why do we keep learning new things? Because it's not always fun, and arguably, once you've mastered a skill, you can choose to ride that skill for a while. But, you know, there's lots of reasons. And basically, we're a curious field, and one of the things that drew me to software, and all of us, I think, is how full of challenges it is. There's always something new to learn, something exciting and different and relevant and delicious. And as curious people, we are drawn to new adventures. So this is a sticky I made from a project I was prototyping last year. And I've been thinking about learning and the balance of productivity and learning because I'm in the middle of I would, a kind of choose your own adventure learning journey. And I'm gonna share some stories from the last couple of years as a way to give context for my thoughts on software as well as to present different paths that you can take to build your careers or the adventures that you want. Um, so yes, I've spent the last 18 months entirely learning new technologies since June of 2016. And usually this, like a learning journey phase is something people do early in their careers or when they're students. Um, but for me, but I've been paid as a dev since 2001, and I plan to be coding sort of well into my 80s. So you could say I'm about a third of the way through my career. <laughs> and that's all the age math you're going to get. <laughs> um, this journey started unexpectedly, though the stage was set. And about 18 months ago, two things coincided. And I'm not going to speak to the image on the left. But the implication of this event was that the person pictured was going to be the Republican nominee for president. And to the words on the right, however, I had been working with a great team at a great company for about four years, and it helped steer the company through a lot of growth, but I wanted to stretch my brain in new directions. Um, and to paraphrase the great thinker, Sophie Kinsella, I felt like technologies were moving on without me. I had a suspicion I'd fallen onto a manager track that was gonna lead me to skill atrophy. And they don't all, not all manager tracks do, but in my case, that's what was happening. And this state of mind coincided with an amazing opportunity um, to join Hillary Clinton's technology team. Uh, and that aligned with my values and gave me a place to put my energy. 
as well as a place to channel my abject terror. <laughs> um, so I jumped at the chance and I went to Brooklyn. And this, I will say, was not a stagnant environment. It was, you can see many people at a desk, many desks at a people, it was crazy. Um, and there were, there's really been a few times in my life where software deadlines have really had like actual meaning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but working on a presidential campaign was one of those times. And on my first day, it was June 27th, I, was, I got there and I was told I had to have a product. It wasn't even fully conceived yet, but it had to be launched by July 17th because that was the day of the counter convention, which is a thing. Like after the Republicans do the convention, the Democrats get to speak back. Um, but yeah, and you don't get to say like, oh, that's hard. It'll be ready the week after the counter convention. Or, this other thing, uh, how about November 10th? <laughs> like, you just don't. So instead, you get to say, holy shit, I don't know any of these technologies. It's a completely new team and environment. Um, but by God, I will learn. <laughs> and this will be out by the counter convention on July 17th, hello, 3 AM. And it was. And it, we had a great team, and we worked long hours, and we got it done. And the team that I was on, um, it was focused on engagement. And we launched seven projects in five months and prototyped about 10 others. And there were also seven other engineering teams focused on different aspects of the campaign. And um, everybody worked very effectively. And not everything didn't always go smoothly. For, for example, Two hours before the second debate, we had written some fact-checking software, and our, our CI system just slowed down. And so I was literally sitting there watching the critical release as the secretary walked onto the stage. <laughs> and it was terrifying, but it got there, and she used it, and it was OK. Um, and I made mistakes. Temp files do not clean themselves up, people. <laughs> Um, but none of them had lasting production level impact. And one of the things I've been thinking about with this whole campaign is how is it possible that we got so much done? And one of the reasons was that the tech team had worked as well as it did was because it had excellent leadership and it was highly diverse. And just a fact, there were over 10 senior female engineers on that team, including the CTO, which was like a first in my career ever. It was the most diverse tech team I'd ever worked on. And just in terms of conversation and experience and collaboration, it was the most high performing and also unforgiving of subpar work and nicest team that I had been on. So if you ever hear that line where people say, oh, we don't want to lower our standards, the culture fit is wrong, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like that's, that's some bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I and mean, when you bring accomplished people from all walks of life who know how to write software together with great leadership, amazing things can happen. Um, another reason things worked so well was there was a specific process for design thinking and idea sharing that was used at the campaign. It was brought over from someone from Google. And um, so in the midst of all of the long hours and all of the shifting focuses and everything, every time any team embarked on a new project, we went through a design review process, which was effectively a structured conversation in a living document in which all the devs could participate by asking questions, participate asynchronously, and then at the very end of this, get in a room together for an hour and um, solidify choices. And the project that I initially showed um, it was designed and built and launched in under two weeks, and a lot of that is interesting because of the security and scalability concerns on the campaign. Um, but in that time, in that two weeks, over 30 engineers participated in the design process, even though there were just three of us on our team building it. And a wide range of questions about security and scaling and product and operations and user experience were highlighted and brought to the fore. To the fore. So this type of process is a way to structure a conversation such that effective software gets built. Um, and so these structural pieces, the diverse team, this great design process um, were in place and supported me through multiple projects, multiple technologies, and multiple awesome dogs. 
Uh, this is Pocket, and with Pocket, I learned to use uh, build and automation tools like Gradle and a customized CI tool that created immutable AMIs on AWS. And I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later, but one of the things I've been noticing in the past few years is the increasing divide between dev and DevOps in tech orgs. And in fact, one of the harder pieces of campaign technology work for me was getting my head around the DevOps piece. But I'll come back to this. Um, <laughs> this is Pupperton. And <laughs> have you ever seen a dog that is like more white space uh, <laughs> honoring than Pupperton? <laughs> I, he, I became proficient in Python and its frameworks with his help. Um, <laughs> Winnie was there. And neither Winnie or I knew what Lua was, but I learned it enough to simulate high load on our services to identify any bottlenecks for election day. And then Social Tito here guided us through multiple cases of Facebook's Open Graph API. <laughs> it was very, very fun, very costumed dog campaign environment. One of them had a drawer of sweaters. Um, <laughs> But working on the campaign was an amazing experience. And I had thought when I joined, like it just might be like this chaotic thing where everybody's in a corner kind of freaking out. But it was a high functioning, well run tech org. And I'm proud of my team, I was proud of the candidate, and I was proud of our work. But when it was over, without the result that we had hoped for and that we had worked so hard for, I realized I wasn't ready for a full time job. <laughs> Do, do I look ready for a full? I can't even tell if that's my actual arm or just like a stick with a hand on it that's holding up some booze for me. Um, and so time passed, and to make myself feel better and more optimistic about the world, I rewatched the entire five seasons of Breaking Bad. <laughs> Which was like genuinely calming. Um, and then, just to do something trivial and lightweight, I decided to learn blockchain. <laughs> I don't know, I was like, I wanna learn blockchain now. <laughs> so I took a contract at a company that was doing some blockchain R&D, and what I got to do was DevOps. And this was interesting, because as I was mentioning before, one of the big gaps in dev teams I've seen over the past few years and experienced as a dev is the space, the growing space between DevOps and dev. And both of the ecosystems are getting more complex. There's more organizational silos. So that's just something to think about. It's almost an aside as we move forward. I think we need roles, sort of cross-functional roles um, to straddle those two areas. But I certainly wasn't there yet. I was grappling with Docker and Kubernetes and Helm and Geth and JavaScript. And since I decided to make 2017 the year of learning to program for the Ethereum blockchain, I also took a very difficult course and this was also hard, but I became, at the time at least, the first female certified Ethereum Solidity developer from that course. <laughs> so, um, I, I say these things not to say fun things I've done, but sort of reflections on a journey through a bunch of unknown landscapes. And a journey that I started when I said to myself, I'm feeling stagnant. Um, and reflections on the fact that I basically spent the last 18 months not knowing what I was doing, taking a deep breath and figuring it out. And we are all figuring it out as we go. And taking a deep breath is actually a true statement because it was about 12 months ago, it was actually during the DevOps phase, that I started feeling like I had ADD, um, anxiety-driven development. <laughs> And so I started doing a daily meditation routine. So thanks to DevOps, again, daily breathing became a way to stay centered. So why, why all this? Why do all this? Like it was rewarding, but it was clearly hard and stressful at times. And why should I tell you the story of me jumping off a bunch of cliffs into new environments? Um, in one part, it's to show how many options you have in our field, all of us. Um, you can go in and you can explore something completely new and come out standing. I, I expanded my boundaries, and when you expand your boundaries, your world becomes bigger. Um, I tried new things, and this gave me renewed empathy for beginners, and also showed me like new insight into what are some current business problems. Or maybe it just boils down to 
get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we hear this a lot. Jillian Michaels said it here. And then this guy, Eric Thomas, changed a word or two, but he said it as well. Um, and Lou Pinella, who was a New York Yankee in the 1980s, also says it. And then this guy, this guy says it, which he doesn't look even remotely comfortable. He looks miserable. I mean, look, at, look, at the, look at that dude. And then this one, and it's like this tuxedo hobo also says it. I mean, is that what it's about? Is being comfortable being uncomfortable what it's all about? No! <laughs> this is my cat, Squeaks. She is not remotely comfortable. I also realize that I am not remotely comfortable when I am, am uncomfortable. In fact, what I am is comfortable being uncomfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> Which I also admit might be a kind of personal masochism, <laughs> seeking out discomfort for Lord knows what kind of familiar territory. But the fact of the matter is that when you're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. You just are. And so the best thing to do is accept that fact that discomfort comes with the territory. It's not going to feel good, and it's not going to be with you forever. Um, and I, I don't know, but maybe people relate more to this than the other, the other one. I don't know. Maybe you all feel super comfortable when you're uncomfortable. But actually, if you think about it, it's recursive. <laughs> and it can go on for quite some time. Does anybody know like the time complexity of this? <laughs> but I mean, part of our job, it's our job to learn. <laughs> Languages, domains, patterns, problems, technical specifications, etc. And so we go from learning to stability, back to learning to stability in this cyclical fashion. But every time we learn something new, we have our previous learnings about learning. Um, to keep us company. And we also become more stable even in times of instability. So even though, for me, even though I was learning, I was able to be high functioning in professional environments because as time progresses, one is able to be more consistently productive just simply because you're adding to your arsenal of things that you already know and things that you've already experienced. Um, some things get easier with time, like debugging and picking up new languages. And some things stay the same, like the learning process. You know, every time you're faced with something new, it can feel like you're looking into a void. And you know, there are some times in the first few weeks of every, like if I'm learning something really new and unfamiliar, where I just have a good old-fashioned cry. <laughs> you know, you start with your little home, and you need to move away from it in order to learn new things. It can feel like you're on a tightrope over an abyss. There are surprises in the waters. You can lose your bearings and then gradually gain your footing again. Um, demons are smaller until finally they become friends. And, and I, it happens every time. And I'm sure everyone here can recognize that body shift, that physical shift from uncertainty and fear to a gradual sense of competence, eventually followed by confidence. Um, and knowing that you can do that as a developer and being familiar with that flow is what gives you more freedom over time. And just, just to revisit what I said earlier about crying, I don't cry every time I learn a new thing. <laughs> if I'm learning something at home or for fun, it's no problem. But just let's say my time was spent getting headless JavaScript tests to run in Nightmare.js against a closure application linked to an instance of the Geth Ethereum blockchain inside a Docker container communicating with another Docker container running on a parallel thread in Jenkins. This is the most buzzwordy wordy thing <laughs> I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and there were tears involved. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Seriously. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, we can't spend all our time learning or wouldn't ship product, pay our, our bills, or keep our jobs. Which is one of the ways that Elixir comes in. So Elixir is a language that was created specifically to introduce new tools 
functional programming, concurrency, a message passing actor model, to a trained fleet of productive developers with as little downtime for ramping up as possible. We heard about it in, in a talk earlier about how the three new developers came in and rewrote a system in Elixir because it's that easy. And my friend and Elixir developer Joe Harrow puts it, with Elixir you can stage a coup from inside a rail shop. <laughs> He actually said literally, and then he's like, you can't use the word literally, but he said literally. <laughs> um, Elixir has two parents, and we know the origin story. José Valin was working on adding concurrency to Ruby on Rails when he discovered Erlang. And Erlang was perfect at doing things natively that he was trying to add to Rails, but he found the syntax and ecosystem off-putting. And so <laughs> he decided to dip the Erlang chocolate in the Ruby peanut butter, and he came up with Elixir. And I'm really sorry that I could not not make this joke, <laughs> but this is a screenshot from a 1980s television commercial for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, and you must hunt it down on YouTube and watch it. And, and right in the middle of this encounter, this like benign patriarch of branded candy shows up in the background. <laughs> So perhaps that's José and Elixir. Anyway, back to Elixir. <laughs> um, languages combining and influencing each other happens all the time. And the lineage, it's not as straightforward as this slide would suggest. I found this. It's a fascinating programming languages genealogical tree. You can't even see it. That's Erlang. It doesn't even have Elixir. Um, but languages combine and recombine. But the truth is, for web application developers and business owners, there are two roads that lead to Elixir, and one is through a rather obscure language invented for telephony applications, <laughs> and the other is down a familiar road that you are probably proficient in, and this is a straightforward choice. <laughs> um, I, I had Ruby and Rails, and I decided to try Erlang, but that was because, A, I was in my spare time, so I had the time to just sort of struggle with it. And also, at the time, I personally felt a little sheltered in my languages, and I wanted to grapple with something, like, really different. Um, and it was hard, but I grew to love the syntax and the language, though I found the ecosystem difficult. For example, at the time I was learning Erlang, this book, was the main resource I found for deploying and managing Erlang apps in production. <laughs> I mean, look, look at the title and the imagery on that. Like, it says it all. <laughs> and I was great on localhost. I was so good on localhost. But deploying and managing apps was something I struggled with a lot, and clearly not alone. <laughs> um, so the practicality of being able to use existing developer talent and, and deploy is huge if you're trying to run a business and make money. <laughs> and there are real and important improvements in Elixir over Erlang, and we've heard so many of them here today. I just did highlight a few, but just listening to everybody talk about how easy it is to pick up and what you can do, but you know, um, string manipulation, just for one. Has anybody here worked with strings in Erlang? Would you agree it's easier in Elixir? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you're like, oh, it's actually a string. I, I spent a bunch of time in Erlang trying to do a tweet parsing API, and so I was, wrote an OAuth library and tried to parse JSON out of these chunks of tweets that weren't connected, and oh my god. It was like the worst, the worst use case for Erlang possible. So it's, this is much nicer in Elixir. Um, like we, again, like we saw today, deployment is so much more e easy. There's people are using Docker, there's distillery, there's CI, there's just so many more straightforward and familiar tools around deployment. Um, the web framework is straightforward. And I think like while Phoenix offers similar functionality to what we might, we, what might, we might be used to from Rails or Django, it's also nicer than Rails because it simply supports Elixir instead of that thing where like in Ruby land people can say, well, I learned Rails, but I don't know Ruby. Like Phoenix supports the Elixir application ecosystem and doesn't try to like be its own thing. Um, and it just opens up so many new domains. Like we've solved, as an industry, we've solved CRUD, and we've solved services and APIs, and now with Elixir's ease with concurrency and the ability to pick it up so quickly, it just opens up so many new business domains and performance improvements. 
So my question is, which was the Trojan horse bringing Erlang to more people? Was it the productivity or was it the syntax? <laughs> you guys. <laughs> um, I guess it really depends on what, path, what your path was. Maybe Ruby people came for the syntax and Erlang folks came for the productivity. Maybe vice versa, but you end up with the same value. Um, but I wanted to show this slide. This is um, from a 2014 Elixir conf um, where Jose is describing his first draft of Elixir. And I paraphrase, but he talks about how he initially tried to fit Erlang constructs into Ruby shapes he understood. And he used this image to represent, I know what shapes I want, but I don't know how to get there. And he describes going through a depression when he realized his early work on Elixir wasn't good, which is his words, not mine. And then he reapproached the project with new understanding. And the reason I bring this up is I think it really exemplifies how grappling with new shapes through the just natural filter of what we already know um, can lead to these round peg square hole moments. And so if you've learned Erlang through Elixir, I would encourage people to take some time to go grapple with Erlang just to get a deeper understanding of that path to it. Um, I found when I was reading Elixir books, to me they seemed a little bit less in depth on some of the core Erlang concepts than the Erlang books that I had read were. And maybe I didn't read all the right books, but it made me wonder if I might have missed some of the nuance. So my advice would be in your learning time, if you haven't already, pick up Erlang. And just spend enough time with it until you are like, oh, I kind of like this syntax. <laughs> and see if it gives you any insights into Elixir. Um, or if it takes you anywhere new. Uh, because spending time with languages that are different from ours or with people who are different from us, basically making ourselves the ones who are getting into new uncomfortable shapes is a way to deepen learning and productivity. Mm. And take a quick moment here to talk about this wall we have in our industry and in our speech about software. And this wall, <laughs> stems from conflicting beliefs on one side, software is magic and it's easy, and then the other is like, writing software is hard. And this conflict often blocks us, both from learning and from communicating, and this word is just. And just is an odd word, because it capitalizes on a secret belief that software is easy, and if it's not, it's our fault. <laughs> and also, project managers use it a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> So when we hear it from others, just represents all these extrajudicial process requests we get, last minute feature request or just one more small thing, ask from someone who's not on your team. And I think it's a word that's used to make you feel bad for not being able to fulfill an unreasonable request. Um, but we use it with ourselves as well and it reflects that same belief, like software production should be quick and easy. It's the way we talk to ourselves when we feel bad about not being as fast as we think we should be, or to avoid specking something out in full. So I just, when you hear that word just uh, from yourself or from others, I would suggest pausing and just to ask like, what's being avoided or is there something we need to, are there conversations that we need to be had? Which brings me to, um, a final piece of this, which is what I call our secret skills. And what is, what is it? What is our secret sauce? Um, and so to do that, I'm going to come back to this earlier slide and look at the bottom two cases, productivity expert and business partner. Um, these are things that software developers also are, but maybe don't notice it as much in your daily work. <laughs> Um, but the tools that we use to write effective software and the learnings from working with stakeholders again and again and again are tools that could augment any business venture. Like, look at all of these techniques and practices that we use to write effective code and launch product quickly. Um, these are absolutely tools that could be used outside of the software development cycle as well. And I have found that many I won't say most, but a lot of non-technology companies just don't have processes in place that technology, the, the processes that technology shops rely on. So, and so they run ad hoc processes to get things done. Um, but without 
understanding the role that process and feedback play in developing product, building software can, become, can be seen as some kind of magic materialization of things. And then this idea that software is developed like a thing by people who know how to develop things can lead to an artificial boundary between the business and tech parts of an org in which like one side ideates and the other side builds a little like elves. Um, and it's, it's, I'm not saying like all devs should go to all business meetings all the time, but recognize from all of the experiences that you have um, how many informed ideas that you have just because of the knowledge of our tools and how the patterns that you know how to recognize about what software is going to work or when it's not going to work. Um, and so if you see these boundaries rising up in your organization, so see if you can talk to somebody about eradicating them so that there's more um, communication. There's a little sidebar, but in 2012, my partner and I started this a consulting service, and we gave pro bono technical advice to non-technical people and entrepreneurs because we found that they, had, they kept running into these really costly mistakes with regard to technology, and this often came from acting on this sort of unexamined belief that software is a thing that you get by like buying it from India or getting a student to build it for free. And they, you know, they lose a lot of money and get these complicated things. And so we sat down with about 400 people over the course of this year. And what we found was most of the time we ended up giving business advice or just applying the productivity and business experiences we had just because we were devs, not because we're MBAs, um, just applying that to their business ventures and helping them think more methodically about what they were trying to build <laughs> and <laughs> what they needed and what they didn't. And I think through this, I really learned that building software while it involves code is not about code. It really is. Building software is a conversation about what a business is. And you talk together and you figure out what are the business priorities? What are we going to build first? Like what, what actually is the business? You try things together, change them, get on f feedback. You know, we have Conway's law, which tells us that the shape of our teams determines the shape of our software. Um, and secondly, software is not a thing. It's an interaction. And this is why there are very few cases where you can have your team in India or your team in Kansas just build it for you. Because it's difficult sending a spec to an offshore team because you lose out on that back and forth part of the process and you instead encode this kind of we think it, you build it mentality. And Businesses fail because conversations fail. Like, they really, really do. And, you know, from a tech standpoint, like, we know this slide, and it's awesome. And we, or me as a dev, or I'm sure all of us at different points, tend to think, well, if we get our tech working right, it's all good, right? But that's, that's not true. <laughs> um, and I'm sure, regardless of your tech, you have all experienced dysfunctional business situations that have impacted development. You know, a, a known poor performer is promoted and that deflates morale and delivery. Or a fast technical talker kind of intimidates management and so common sense is overridden. A company builds a giant product without talking to users and then it's like, hey, nobody's using this, like why? <laughs> Or a team of 200 devs moves like so much slower than a team of three devs. And I know you've seen these and more, I'm sure you can list them out, but all of these are instances where not having difficult conversations or we're assuming that there should be some minimal interaction has material impact on the morale of a team and the success of a venture. And it's not fun. You tune out, you go somewhere else, you quit your job, the software stalls, it gets caught in endless cycles, and at the end it's just, all that's left are clenched fists. And I, I feel like the, the most relevant thing I've learned in 17 years of developing software, and weirdly, the thing most likely to guarantee technical success, is that software is a conversation. And I, I literally mean this literally. And I, in conversation, I don't mean prepared speech like I'm doing up here, but like the result of listening and going beyond what you know, and understanding what someone really wants, and also understanding what their fantasy is, and how their fantasy of a magic software business is leading them astray. 
you know, conversation is a generative act where two or more people end up with something that just couldn't exist without them. And then also the output of successful software is actually conversation. Like think about, we, we interact with other humans in order to build experiences that facilitate interactions between other sets of humans. And I, sometimes we build software to replace people's jobs or to kill them. But for the most part, software is about facilitating a conversation or an interaction that wasn't there before, a connection or an interaction. And so these things that we think of as soft skills are hard, and not only hard difficult, but hard technical. Um, these so-called soft skills are often, and not always, um, but often the difference between successful and not successful ventures. Um, so what can we, as our imperfect circle squares that we are, what, what do we do about this? How can we get better at both the hard and the soft aspects of our jobs? Obviously experience is one teacher. Um, and then just here's some other suggestions. There's, there's some wonderful non-technical reading. Um, these two books, Crucial Conversations and Radical Candor both address how to broach difficult topics in an authentic way. And they're worth reading and possibly introducing in your organization. This one's kind of weird, but take an improv class. Because <laughs> improv, improv is like not about telling jokes and being funny. It's actually um, about learning to listen to someone else and then spinning an idea together in, like spinning an idea together, together. Sentence didn't work, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> um, and I did this once. I didn't do it to be fun, but funny, but I actually thought, oh, you take this to be funny, but you really, it's a really about listening, um, and you can ask me about it. Um, learn a new language, which really, frankly, that's what everybody here is doing, so just keep doing the thing that you're doing. But for your next one, either like pick one that you're curious about, or maybe pick one that you think you might hate. <laughs> Just like something different from your most familiar language and go into it, you know. You'll get better at learning, you'll know another language, and then the one you pick up right after that will be that much easier. Doesn't really matter which, just whatever. Um, find a diverse team, or make your team a diverse team, or join a diverse team. Like, look at how well these four animals are doing together. <laughs> and the crab is an introvert. <laughs> but it's okay with the others. <laughs> and it's, it's, not because, it's not because his bubble wouldn't fit on the slide. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this process implement, the, that I described in the context of the Hillary campaign is a wonderful, it's a wonderful process and it's super concrete. Um, for vetting and explaining a technical idea. And so I encourage you to look at bringing, like, bringing this system into your own companies. Uh, this is what I've done over the last year and a half. And so I would say to anyone who's an expert in their field, I'm sure there's people here who are very experienced and expert, and go back to school or, or be an apprentice on something or put yourself in a work position where you really don't know anything, like join a modern DevOps team for one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> but like just going back to beginner state will help you like identify other leaders, kind of lighten the load of like trying to make decisions and regain empathy with actual beginners. Um, but on the other hand, if you are a beginner or you kind of like fall back into like, I'm always learning, like, Become an expert for a while. Just be like, fuck it. Step into a leadership role. You know, see what it feels like to take on responsibilities, make decisions, like get comfortable wielding a little bit of power. <laughs> um, this is nice. I've liked this. Just find a few moments every day to center yourself and give yourself some space. And finally, what, whatever the fuck it is that makes you look like this dog, <laughs> do it. <laughs> And that's it. Thank you so much. Have fun at the party.